Well, good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. A uh, few extra people tonight. Apparently, Jonathan's starting to charge too much to get into the college class, and so they all came down here because they heard I charge half as much. And so don't tell them you don't pay anything because this is how I'm going to eat pizza for the next three weeks. So good to see everybody tonight. We are studying uh, out of the Gospels about some of Jesus' miracles. If you've been in here, you know that. If you're interlopers, that's what we're doing. Uh, last class, we looked at the feeding of the 5,000. The one, perhaps the most remarkable then of the, uh, of the miraculous accounts, uh, recorded in all four of the Gospels. You know, some of these accounts are only in the synoptics. Some of them, of course, only really unique to the Gospel of John. Uh, but the feeding of the 5,000 across the, the scope of the four Gospel accounts. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at an account that follows immediately after, uh, in three of the accounts anyway. Uh, Luke does not include it, uh, but the other three do, Matthew, Mark, and John. And we're going to be looking at John 6. So if you want to open to John 6, is the account of Jesus walking on the water. And you know, in Matthew's account, Peter actually decides to join him for a minute. And uh, if you didn't know that, I'm sorry. Uh, ruined the whole story for you. But Jesus walks on the water after the feeding of the 4,000, or 5,000, and uh, we will look at that uh, tonight. So, in what time we have, we'll see what lessons there are there and uh, apply them and uh, move forward. So, good to see you all here tonight. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Father, for this good day, we thank you so much. We know that you bless us with so many good things. We look around us. We look to one side and another. We see good people who love you. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have to be with one another. We know, Father, in a changing world, in a difficult world, so many times we have these things to rely on that there are brothers and sisters that we can look to, that there's your word that we can read and truly know what you would have us to do. And we know these things, Father, that you give us in a spiritual way, are eternal, that you seek to have us home with you in heaven so that you give us a way home through your Son. We thank you for that. We pray we'd always remember that and always value that. And always, Father, remember to keep that first and foremost in our lives. Help us, Father, not to be distracted by this world. Help us not to be frightened by this world. Help us to remember that you're always in charge, you're always with us, you always care for us. Help us, Father, in all we do to be more like your Son. We pray in his name tonight. Amen. All right, so I'm looking in, in John chapter 6. Of course, John 6, one of the places where you have the, the feeding of the 5,000. Um, and so I want to look right at the end of that account. Again, uh, all four of the gospel accounts have this, uh, the feeding of the 5,000. And when you get in John's account, by the time you get to verse 14, it's winding up. Uh, the day has come to an end, at least 5,000 men, doesn't count the women and children that are there, and remember the five loaves, two fish, Jesus giving thanks, right? and then giving to his apostles uh, the five loaves and two fish, five loaves and two fish, who knows how that worked, but until everybody was filled, and then those 12 baskets of fragments left over so that nothing would be wasted. You don't waste the Father's blessings, and the Father gives as much as we need and more, we know that. And so, this is one more example. So in John 6, as in the other three gospel accounts, you have that. And so, not surprisingly, people want to keep him around. Uh, in verse 14, in John chapter 6, it says, Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him a king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Pause there for a second. John's account is interesting. Some of you have studied this a good bit. Maybe some of you haven't. But in John's account, you do have some unique things within it. Perhaps based on the timing of John's writing, we, we just don't know. Maybe who John was around. Don't forget for a moment that at the foot of the cross, John stands, and Jesus on the cross commits John to take care of his mother Mary. Who knows what Mary related to him about her son's ministry that she heard? I don't know. And there are other things in John's account that are unique. You know, John alone tells us at the beginning of his account that Jesus didn't need to ask anything about anyone, to paraphrase. Jesus knew what was in a man. He could tell the heart of a person. So here he perceives. He perceives. And the other gospel accounts that record this don't have this. He perceives that they're going to make him a king by force. And so he withdraws to a mountain by himself to pray. And so we've got this from John's account. 
He understands what they're about. It's not his work here to become a king the way they think. And so he withdraws to the mountain. What do these people want? Feeding of the 5,000 and those children and the, the women that are there. So who knows? 15,000 people, huge crowd. Everybody fed. What do these people want? They've seen a great sign. What do they want, do you suppose, at this juncture? They want a king. But why? They're always looking for the physical kingdom, aren't they? They always want to return to glory. We get that. When we don't have what we've had before that's been great, we want to return to that. I mean, football teams, every year you hear about a return to glory. Once again, Notre Dame's not there. Thank goodness. One more prayer that's answered, right? Many overrated things in this world. Notre Dame football is one of them. If you're a Notre Dame fan, I just lost you. But frankly, you got what you deserved. They're 0-2 once and again. So the idea of a return to glory, right? We want the Davidic kingdom redone. We want Solomon's glory. One more time. We want the Romans out, the Hebrews in charge. We want a king. And as I've said in here before, if you've been in this class right along, the Gospel of Matthew from beginning to end is all about teaching about the kingdom. What does Jesus do in the context of the feeding of the 5,000? When the people show up, he teaches them. He heals their sick, but he teaches them about the kingdom because he doesn't want them to get the idea like they have that he's going to be a physical king. This is going to be a spiritual kingdom. This is something different. They, he perceives that they're just going to take him and make him king. Well, could they do that? They couldn't do anything that Jesus didn't want done. The point is, he knows, this is a time for me to withdraw. This is a time for me to go to the Father in prayer. He withdraws. He does that. What else are they looking for? They want their physical kingdom back. They've just been fed. Now, if you've eaten supper tonight, you know. You've been fed. Are you done eating? No more food for the rest of the week. Hey, look, if somebody fed you and it was a good meal, what are you looking for? A return to glory, right? Please give me that one again. Now, you think about it. People want the physical sustenance. They want that here. They want that here. They want him to make him king. If he's cared for us this way, perhaps he'll care for us again. If you don't think that's so, we'll get to the, the postscript of this account in John by the end of class, because they're going to come and find him, right? And what are they going to be looking for? Not for teachings about a spiritual kingdom. They're coming to him in the Gospel of John after the walking on the water to find food, and Jesus knows that. You've come to me not looking for truth. You've come to me looking for bread. Tell you what, I'm the bread of life. So you know where this story goes. So they want a king to care for him, to protect him. All the reasons we would want someone like this in our lives. Sustenance, protection, drive out the enemy, all those things. And so Jesus withdraws to the mountain by himself alone. We'll keep with John's account for a minute. In verse 16, John tells us in chapter 6 that when the evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, and after getting in a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and almost parenthetically, John tells us Jesus has not come to them yet. So he goes farther, and we're told this. In verse 18, the sea begins to be stirred up because a strong wind's blowing, and when they'd rowed about three or four miles, which is about halfway across the Sea of Galilee, three to four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened. I would imagine. Uh, the Bible is full of understatements. I would say they're frightened. The other two gospel accounts that tell us about this make it far more graphic. They're terrified. They think he's a ghost. What would you think? I mean, here he, here he is walking across the sea. What are you thinking? You know what Peter's going to do? Is it really you? You know, if it is, then tell me to get out of the boat. But here they're afraid. What's Jesus' response? I'm walking on the water after I've fed at least, what, probably 15,000 people. What's his response? He said he yeah. died, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Uh, it's me. Don't, don't, don't worry. Now, how, how hard would that one be to sell? It's me. I'm walking on the water. Yeah, don't worry about it. I mean, I, I don't know what else they would have perceived. They did think it could be a spirit or a ghost. We're told that. 
but they are terribly frightened. Jesus doesn't want them frightened. It's not his intent here. And so he tells them, don't, don't be afraid. Remember, we've seen this right along through the gospel accounts. People get into the presence of the Lord, and they are scared. They do drop back. They do hit the deck. We find that in multiple cases. Here's another case. And this is Jesus walking on the water. I mean, they're terrified. And so he tells them, don't, don't be afraid. It is I. Verse 21, then John skips ahead here in the story. In verse 21, they're willing to receive him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. And we'll stop there with John's account. Immediately, they're halfway across. They get to the other side, three or four miles, like that. They're there. Now, where John is going to continue on that we'll come back to is an account of the people they left behind looking for him. And they'll cross the sea looking for him. Okay? So that's what John has to tell us, at least at that juncture of the story. That's what we've got. Uh, the people thinking that this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. They look to seize him. Jesus goes to the mountain. His disciples go out onto the water. And the winds and waves come up. Look at Mark's account with me. Uh, back up, same chapter number, different gospel account. But look at Mark chapter 6 with me. Again, right after the feeding of the 5,000. Mark has some interesting insights. In all four of these gospel accounts, inspired, of course, all giving us, remember, different views, different perspectives on the Savior's life and His works, His miracles, all giving us a different angle. Remember, just like somebody would give you a different angle on your life than someone else that looked at it. Inspired, yes, and yet they're looking at it from different, different perspectives sometimes based on other information perhaps that they'd gotten, like maybe John writing, getting information even from Jesus' own mother. So in Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6, we've got a parallel account. I'm looking all the way down to verse 45. Mark tells us very quickly, 5,000 men ate the loaves, not counting the women and children then, just 5,000 men. In verse 45, Immediately, you know John, Mark's account. It's forever something's happening immediately. You know, things are happening in a hurry. That's how Mark tells his account. And so here immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Bethsaida while he himself was sending the crowd away. And bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. For whatever reason, Mark's not aware of what John is writing about. Wasn't inspired in the same way. And so where John tells us what Jesus perceives, Mark doesn't even touch that. And Jesus is sending the crowd away and then withdrawing to the mountain. The disciples go into the boat, and they start across the water. Verse 47 tells us it's evening. The boat's in the middle of the sea, so three to four miles out. Again, we're pretty hard on these people. We really are. These apostles, remember, people that live in the past don't sit around saying, gee whiz, sure is interesting to live in the past. David McCullough, writing about history years ago, made that remark. And he's right. I mean, people that live in the past have no idea what's going to happen in the future. Any more than I can tell you what's going to happen at 716 when it's 715. I don't know. Neither do you. And yet when we study about people in the past, we're real quick to cast judgment. Well, they should have known. They should have known. I wouldn't have done that. I mean, we are Monday morning quarterbacks all the time, unless it's Monday night football, and then we're Tuesday morning quarterbacks, right? And why the Denver coach called for a field goal and didn't have the quarterback throw the ball, if you know what I'm talking about, is amazing to me. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then you are not a football fan, and probably you did better things with your time. I don't know. I myself read the story the next morning. I wasn't going to stay up and watch that. That's just craziness, right? Uh, so at any rate, we think later, well, I would have done that, I wouldn't have done this. We do the same thing to these people. They are three to four miles out on the sea. The wind is contrary, as it would say in some places. In other words, they're in something of rough water. Remember, just like when their boat started to fill in one of the stories. These are professional fishermen, some of them, but they know a difficult time when they see one. And in Matthew's account, it's going to say that they are straining against the oars. So they, they are in tough shape. 
It's also told to us in these two synoptic accounts that it's the fourth watch of the night when Jesus gets to him. A lot of you know that, right? What's the fourth watch of the night? All you're thinking of is first watch, and now I'm happy, now I'm hungry for brunch, right? You're telling me about food tonight. What's the fourth watch of the night? Yeah, exactly right. The way the Jews measured time was in those incremental changes, right? Six to nine, nine to twelve, twelve to three, three to six, etc. So in the fourth watch of the night, it is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. Now, I'm not going to look to that side of the room. How many of you are up between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning? Just don't even answer. That's why some of your number are sick right now because they can't go to sleep and get the rest, right? You know it. How well are we functioning between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning unless you have a regular job that gets you up at that time? Some of you, like me, worked a midnight shift before. And even if your body is used to getting up and functioning at that time, it's still not very normal, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. You're in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. You are straining against the oars, all 12 of you. And you are tired. You're exhausted at 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, and when you're tired, you're exhausted. The sea's up. You're not sure what's going to happen next. And you look out and you see somebody walking toward... What would you think? Would you think, oh, that's Jesus. Yeah, that's got to be him. And who knows what you would think? Probably you wouldn't say it's a ghost, but you wouldn't have the, and you'd probably be frightened. What is that? Who is that? And so here we have the scene. Here we have the scene. Straining against the oars, we're told in verse 48, for the winds against them, about the fourth watch of the night, Mark tells us in verse 48. He came to them walking on the sea, and the way Mark tells it is, It looks like he intends to pass them by. So he's walking towards them, but it looks like to them he might pass them by. In verse 49, Mark tells us that when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and they cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. All three of the accounts have that almost the same exact language, which is telling. If the Holy Spirit goes out of his way to use the same language, at least in the English translations, in these accounts, that tells me God's trying to tell me something. Take courage. Don't worry. It's me. I'm not saying you're going to be on the Sea of Galilee halfway out there and Jesus is going to come walk to you on the water. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying this. We've all been in situations like we've talked about with your boat filling up with water and you wonder, how in the world am I going to get out of this one? That's how these guys feel. When's Jesus come across the water to us, figuratively speaking? When we expect it? That never happens when you expect it. When's Jesus really respond? When you pray? Oh, I don't know. It happens differently for everybody, I suppose. I would say this, though. God tends to intervene in our lives when we pray in ways that we least expect. Am I the only one that's happened to? When you least expect it, sometimes things happen. And they happen sometimes in a different way than what you prayed for. The providence of God is real. And our prayer life is something that can be quite effective. But we're just not always prepared for how he's going to enter it. For these guys, it's physically. He's walking across the water. I don't know. For one of us, it might be an answer to a prayer that we just didn't didn't see as feasible. We just didn't think it was possible. We didn't think God could work that way. And we're amazed that somehow God worked in our lives. Somebody's hand up? Yeah, Matt. That's right. What Matt was saying is, you know, we just don't attribute to God the power that he really has, that he intervenes the way he can. I mean, I'm not even going to ask Matt, but you're holding a little kid there, I think. 
unless you ate too much pizza and you're carrying a lot of weight tonight. But you know, did you ever think you could be that happy? I'm going to look at you. I know that the answer is no. I mean, anybody that's a new parent, you just cannot imagine the joy that comes into your life when a child's born. You can't imagine that God would bless you that way. You can't imagine, you know, and then it's there. Then, then it's happening. And yeah, we're real quick to say, well, it just sort of happened that way. And God's nature is fixed. God's nature doesn't change. Now, the way he chooses to do things, that will change over time. And from person to person, sometimes it appears. But his nature is such that he wants to give to his children. And of course, he's going to bless us in his time, in his way. We want it in our time, in our way. And so figuratively speaking, if we see him on the water, we'd be terrified. It's just not what I expected. Not what I expected. Don, what was she going to say? That's right. That's exactly right. The same love and compassion. And certainly that's implied here. You know, you said something interesting, Don. He sees them. The accounts tell us that. He, he sees them. Well, what's that? He, yeah, that's miraculous in and of itself. He is on a mountain praying. They are straining at the oars. They're halfway across the Sea of Galilee. He sees them. Don't let that be lost on you. He knows what's happening. And so, yes, I'm going to go help my, I'm going to go help my apostles. And, you know, it's compassion, and it's also what? It's one more piece of proof that, hey, look, if I can walk on the water, sort of like if I can feed 15,000 people with five loaves and two fish, well, then maybe you shouldn't be so worried about this physical world. If I need to, don't you think I can intervene? If I need to, don't you think I can help you with your life? If you need those things and we serve a loving Father, don't you think that through His compassion He's going to help you? Or do you think He's not there just because He doesn't operate on your schedule or in a way that you expect? So what is it? And so clearly He helps us as we need. But yeah, it's definitely compassionate. Yes, sir. And with it being in His time and His way, because He can see the, the whole picture of our entire life, we can mm -hmm. That thing happens in a way I don't expect, but then he sets up many other things that I also didn't expect that were blessings, that were good. And it seems like he's doing that even here. It's another way for him to demonstrate his sovereignty, his control, his ultimate power, while also assisting his apostles. Yeah, he definitely is. You know, the idea of doing several things all at once for God is, is not unique to this miracle. You think about it. Again, remember... Time is set up for us. The world was created in seven days. Well, that, that's unusual when you think about how other things are done in the natural world. He creates it in seven days, and he makes time for us with the sun rising and setting and the seasons just as they are. He doesn't need that. That orders our lives, and for a multitude of reasons, he set it up that way, I suppose. But everything exists as effectively one day for him. He can see everything. All at a glance, it appears a thousand days or a thousand years or as a day. And a day is a thousand years. That's daunting, if not impossible, for physical people in a physical world with physical time to deal with. It's very difficult for us to get our minds around. But I'd suggest this, and some of us have worked with this and dealt with this and, and had to do this, and some of us haven't. But if you've ever had to correct or discipline or help or encourage, there's often more than one thing that's going on there. I mean, all three of my kids needed to be spanked once in a while. You know, I won't say which one needed it the most. It was Riley. And so I could hardly break a board over that kid to make him behave. Don't call the cops on me. He's just fine, by the way. Uh, he only has a slight twitch. Now, Riley, I mean, 
What was I trying to do? Punish him alone? No, I'm trying to correct him, help him, discipline him, teach him, help him become a better person. You pray it works out, and for human beings, that's what you're doing. I hope the decisions I'm making with my kids or with my friends or whatever are appropriate, that they'll work. God knows what he's doing at all times. That, that's the huge difference. We can't see the end from the beginning. You hope, you pray that what you're doing is going to be effective. So if we do those things, and we're kind of comfortable with, yeah, I'm doing more than one thing at once, and the kids aren't just going to, they're just not going to understand it, but they'll understand it later. We understand doing things like that. How much more God doing those things? We're not going to always get it, and that's okay. We have to, and that goes to our trust and our faith. You know, these apostles on the water, halfway across the Sea of Galilee, yeah, they had every reason to be scared to death. They weren't expecting this. They weren't expecting this at all. And Mark goes further, and he explains why. And it's a cutting remark. Jonathan's going to be teaching for me on Sunday again, because I'm going to be up in Bowling Green on Sunday just for the weekend. And uh, there might be some baseball involved. I can't tell you that, but... You know, that's, that may happen. When Jonathan teaches, he's going to be teaching the, the feeding of the 4,000. And Mark makes a similar comment here, or in that story, as he does here. So read on with me. Uh, it says in verse 49 that after they see him, you know, it's the fourth watch of the night. In verse 49 in Mark 6, it says, When they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately spoke with them and said, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Verse 51, then he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped. Mark tells us this, they were utterly astonished, and then indicts them all. Look, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves. I love the way he puts that. The inc- we would say the feeding of the 5,000. Mark, the incident of the loaves. It sounds like a Perry Mason detective story the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. That's tough stuff right there. And then they crossed over. They came to land at Gennesaret, moored to the shore, and people saw him and ran out to him. Mark says something that's very telling that's going to repeat in the, in the aftermath of the feeding of the 4,000. They did not understand because their heart was hardened. What's that mean? Now, we think about Pharaoh's heart being hardened, hardened heart. We kind of get the, the image in our mind, sort of, kind of. What's God mean here? What's Mark getting at? What softens your heart? Anything? What's the difference between a hard heart and a soft heart when it comes to God and God's Word? Think about the images that Jesus uses. Agricultural images. What absorbs seed better? Hard or soft soil? Soft soil. What soil is easier to plow? Hard or soft soil? Soft soil. And you go down the list and it's all the same. It's always going to be the soft soil that's easier to work with. The heart is the same way. We talk a good game when we say, well, it's a hardened heart. People don't even know what they're saying half the time. It becomes Church of Christ speak if we're not careful. It makes good common sense. If someone's heart is hardened, they're less likely to have God's Word penetrate it, to get into it, because that's what's going to make the difference. You might be a great example, and you all are. You might be great encouragers. Well, you all are. But it's God's Word that makes the difference, and we all know that. We all know that. It's either you absorb it or allow it to be absorbed into your heart or not. That is a choice. You can have a hardened heart. You can work on that one. I wouldn't recommend it. But when do we harden our heart? But when we don't want to hear what He has to say, and we keep it out. The same way that a piece of ground can be so hard you cannot penetrate it, with seed so that things will grow. Don't forget the imagery that Jesus uses. It really makes a difference when you think about how Mark writes here. Mark's clearly affected by what Jesus' teachings were because he repeats this. Their hearts are hardened. 
Well, they just weren't getting it, we would say. Well, why not? Their hearts weren't soft enough yet. They weren't willing to take in everything that Jesus is teaching and and what should be now growing in their lives, which is faith. That's not easy. Again, it's easy for us to look back and say, I wouldn't have been like that. How many of us on our worst days have a hard time trusting God or just want to push Him to do more quicker? Do we have a soft enough heart to accept what He says, which is, I will take care of you. I love you. I am your father. My son is the good shepherd. You can trust him. Do we have enough faith to accept that? Or are our hearts hardened? Here they didn't get it. They didn't understand. Mark says simply, they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves because their hearts hardened. What was the incident? The whole point was, I can do whatever I want to do with the physical world. I was there at the beginning. I was there at creation. The epistles tell us everything holds together because of the Lord. In Him, all things hold together. So if that truly is the case, and if we're people people of faith, we accept that, why are we worried about a physical world? Why are we so worried about things happening in time the way we want them in a physical sense? And the answer is simple. Don't be so hard on ourselves. We get like that because this is what we know. This is everyday life. The bodies that we have, the time that we have to work with, the physical constraints that we have, the weather that surrounds us. And if we're not careful, we're held hostage by a physical world. That's all we see. And Jesus encourages us, implores us to think beyond that. The first thing, remember, in so many of these miracles is not the physical healing. It's the spiritual healing. Your sins are forgiven, right? So many times you find that. It's not the physical thing. What's he do when those people come to him? There before he feeds them physically. Remember, he feeds them spiritually. Let me tell you about the kingdom. Let me tell you what's coming. Let me tell you what life's really about. Then he feeds them physically. And so we get this reversed all the time, and Mark's just very plain about it. Our hearts were hardened. We just didn't have soft enough hearts to take this in yet. It's hard to accept that. It is hard to accept that because we live in a physical world. The enemy will try to convince us the whole time that the physical world is all that matters. Where is God, right? What's the enemy going to say? Where is God? I mean, if you believe in a spiritual kingdom, well, then please explain to me evil in the world, right? I mean, you go back to the writings of C.S. Lewis or a lot of people before him that grapple with that. I mean, how do you deal with that? But Jesus implores us, put the spiritual first. Don't let your heart be hardened. Gain insight here, Jesus would say, from the incident of the loaves. Don't be so concerned. All you got to do is read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and how many times, right? Don't be so worried about the physical world. If I take care of the birds, I'm going to take care of you. Come on. Believe a little bit more. That's what he's telling us. So in Mark's account, this is what we have. And Mark's pretty plain about why they don't get it. Now keep reading with me. Uh, Verse 53, it says in Mark 6, they crossed over, they get to Gennesaret, they moor to the shore, Now look at verse 54, because Matthew repeats this. Verse 54, it says, When they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized the Lord. They ran ran about that whole country and began to carry here and there on their pallets. I love the imagery. They carry from here and there on their pallets all the sick that they have to the place where they heard he was. Remember, this is the height of Jesus's, if I can use the term, the height of his celebrity. And he's going to throw it all away, you find in the, in the John account. But here they're running to him, to the place where he was. And wherever, in verse 56 we're told, wherever he entered villages or cities or countryside, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces and imploring him that they just might just touch the fringe of the cloak, the fringe of his cloak, and as many as touched it were being cured. That's faith. Think about that woman with the 12-year issue of blood. What did she know? All I've got to do is get to just the fringe, 
just the bottom. Remember, she crawled on the ground to get to him. All I've got to do is touch the fringe of the cloak. He doesn't even have to pay attention to me. All I've got to do is touch that, I'll be healed. I'll reach out to God's promises. I'll be healed. This is what people are doing. This is remarkable. And people realize the real power here. Now, where is their faith and where are their hearts? We don't know. God knows. We know in the John account, some people are going to come to him just wanting food. That appears to be the people re- returning from across the sea. These are the people that are there on that shore. I don't know how much of a difference there is in that, but there seems to be some. So that's how Mark tells the story. Uh, flip back with me in uh, Matthew's account. Perhaps the most famous because of the reason it includes Peter stepping onto the, stepping onto the water. But in Matthew's account, you've got very similar things, and it teaches in similar ways. I say that because I, I would encourage you, when you read through these gospel accounts, these various miracles that Jesus does, even when they're parallel accounts, you are getting different versions. No, you're getting different perspectives. Think about it that way. You're getting different angles on similar events, if not the same events. God's trying to tell us something about these different things using different writers. It's a beautiful way to teach. You, th- you think about it. If you could hear a lesson and you could hear it from three or four different people, you would not get carbon copies. You would get different perspectives, different angles, different insights based on people's background, their thoughts, where their heart is, any number of things. And, and that's what we have here. So in Matthew's account, I'm looking at chapter 14. It's Matthew's account. And there in chapter 14, again, we're told in verse 23, since the crowd's away, goes up on the mountain by himself to pray. I've gone over this three times now, and don't overlook that. What does Jesus consistently find time to do? And it's usually after everybody else is taken care of. In fact, there's very few times I can think of, of any, where Jesus puts himself first and says, you know what, I know you need to be healed, you hold right there, I'm going to go pray. You just don't find that. He is hanging on the cross, suffering, and he looks down and takes care of his mother before he finally, finally gives up the ghost. Here, he, he puts everybody else first, then he goes up on the mountain to pray. So all three of the counts have that. He is up on the mountain, he's praying, in verse 23. And again, verse 24, long distance, halfway across the sea, battered by the waves, Matthew says. Verse 25, fourth watch of the night again. Verse 26, the disciples see him walking. They are terrified, Matthew uses the word in the English translation. At least the New American Standard has terrified. And they cry out in fear. And again, in verse 27, Jesus says, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And it's in Matthew's account alone, for whatever reason, and Matthew includes the, the incident of Peter, I guess, where Peter hears him and then says, Lord, if it is you, then command me to come out onto the water. A little doubt? I think we'd probably doubt a little bit too. Is that really Jesus? Well, if that is you, tell me to get out of the boat. That takes a lot of trust. And we're real hard on Peter. Sometimes we have a good reason to be, I suppose, but people could be real hard on us too. And it's been said before, it's nothing new. Would any of us have the courage to say, tell me to get out of the boat? You're doing a good job, not so sure how I'm going to do. Now, Peter says, command me to get out of the boat. And so Jesus says, come, and Peter gets out of the boat, walks on the water, and came toward Jesus. How many steps? We don't know. If I've heard one lesson, I've heard 15 that speculate about different things. Frankly, it doesn't matter if he took one step or 15 or 20 steps. He gets out of that boat, shows enough faith to do that, and starts moving towards the Lord. And at some point, what happens? Yeah, you know, four or five letter word like yikes, right? I'm on the water and the wind's blowing. It says that distracted him in a sense. And he begins to sink. And he does the right thing. Lord, save me. He doesn't try to swim. You know, he doesn't yell out to one of the other apostles. Lord, save me. Save me. 
And immediately, verse 31, Jesus stretches out his hand, takes a hold of him, and says to him some pretty tough words given the situation. Oh, you have little faith. You know, why'd you doubt? Why did you doubt? You saw me walking on the water. You saw me feed how many ever thousand people, at least 5,000, right? Why did you doubt that you could walk on the water too? And it's because it's tough on us in a physical world to believe in a spiritual kingdom. Don't lose sight of that. That's a common theme. It's difficult. I think the Lord certainly understands that. He lived a physical life on this earth. He knows how hard it is. Subtract the technology. Subtract the modern conveniences. And human beings haven't changed a whole lot. I said God's nature is fixed. It's eternal. Man's nature is pretty well fixed too. The rest of it's in a swirl from generation to generation. But man's nature is pretty well fixed. We are flawed people. And so it's tough for us in a physical world to get our arms around a spiritual reality. Even if we saw him work these great miracles. I mentioned Matt over there. You hold a little baby in your hands and you realize the kind of incredible power God has to create a world in a physical realm like this with little babies being born just like that. And you hold that little child. It's just amazing. That's your child. And you know that's real. And you see other things that happen in life. But somehow you discount that God can do other things or that it is just happenstance or random chance. Albert Einstein said a long time ago that God doesn't play dice. God doesn't take chances. God doesn't just, you know, throw things out there. It's not like that. We don't serve a God of random chance. And so, but it's hard on us to believe that we can actually, like in this case, walk on water. And that that would be hard. And so when God tells us, look, you need to trust me. You need to trust me and not doubt That is tough. That is tough sledding. And if you struggle with that, we all pray about those things. Find someone to encourage you and pray with you. Read through these accounts. Think back to how many times God has affected your life in a positive way, changed it in ways you never really expected. And maybe you gain a little bit more faith. But he understands. And the Lord walked the earth. He understands how hard it is for us. If it wasn't so hard, then... Why then was he on his face in the garden praying for a different way other than crucifixion? He understood how hard a physical life is and what real physical pain is. So the idea that Peter says, I can't do this, he's distracted, however you want to put it, he begins to sink. That shouldn't be so surprising. If it is you, tell me to come out to see you. And Jesus does. Now Matthew also tells us this. Um, you know, his disciples, his apostles in verse 33, after the wind stops, worship him and say that you are truly, certainly God's son. And again, the parallel to Mark, they land, people of that place recognize him, they sent word into the surrounding district, bring to him all that were sick, and again, same language, implored him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak, and as many as touched were healed. We've got just a couple minutes Flip back to the postscript. Flip back to John chapter 6 in the couple minutes we've got left. Because you know, a lot of you know the end of the story here. The little postscript. That really ties the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the water together. Right? As, they're, as they come to the other side of the sea and those people come out to be healed, those people that Jesus left came looking for him. And Jesus knows the heart. So if you look at John chapter 6, In verse 25, it says, They found him on the other side of the sea. And they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And it's a lot like Nicodemus in John 3. Jesus doesn't answer the question. He tells them what they need to hear, which is, you're not looking for me for the right reasons. You're looking to me because you were filled and you want more food. You need to be concerned about real bread, really what gives you life. So, Think about that. Consider the rest of John 6. Jonathan will take over and teach the feeding of the 4,000 on Sunday, and uh, you can look forward to seeing him then. Appreciate you being here. Hope you have a good night.
Also got a lot of visitors with us, so I think there's some events going on down down the, down the street, and we've got a lot of visitors with us tonight. So we want you to know that you're welcome, and we hope that you'll stay around for a few minutes after our services to get to know us a little bit, give us a chance to to know you. I've got just a couple of announcements before we leave tonight that I wanted to, to uh, make. I think most of you are aware that Don is traveling. He's in Iowa doing a meeting this week, and he'll be traveling back tomorrow. So we want to pray that he he will have safe. Uh, journey, and um, uh, it, it, it's also been brought to my attention there's a flu bug going around. Quite a, quite a few of our folks have the flu. JB is among that number, and so we hope that all of them will have a mild case and will be back with us quickly. And also, um, it's brought to my attention that we have a plethora of umbrellas in the lobby. With all the rain we've been having, uh, we've got a, a lot of umbrellas out there, so if you've left an umbrella here, make a point to pick it up tonight so you'll be prepared on Sunday when it rains. So, um, uh, and then one final thing I wanted to mention, if you have the opportunity to speak with Carl and Barbara Maine this evening, uh, congratulate them. Today is their 60th wedding anniversary. And so we certainly wanna congratulate them on that. So um, make the opportunity to speak with them this evening if you can. All right, I hope all of you will have a, a good rest of the week. We're going to sing another song, and we'll be led in closing prayer. And I hope to see you all back again on Sunday.
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, your name alone is holy. We praise you. We are in awe of you. You are the one who has control over all nature, and what a wonderful thing it is that you consider us, that you care for us, you give us all the things that we need, and that you desire us and desire to be our God and desire for us to have no other gods before you. We look forward to your heavenly kingdom one day and pray that you be with us as we seek to do your work on this earth. Please help us to have eyes to see the people who need, who need us to serve them. Pray that we will have eyes for the orphans and the widows. Pray that we will have mouths to proclaim the gospel into all the world. Pray that you be with this church. Be with us as we go out from here. Please guide us away from temptation and deliver us from evil. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who died for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.